go firmly doing. Yeah, by God's grace, we are all doing yeah. well. Wow, <laughs> wow, fantastic. Excellent. Good to see you and that wonderful <laughs> smile as well. Glory to God. Glory to God. All right, all right, all right, all right. Let's get into this. A lot to cover today. Yeah. So we want to just get into this ASAP to the praise and to the glory of God. Hello, Sister Philomena. Bless you. I know she's busy, so she cannot really talk. I know she's at work, so we understand. Fantastic. All right. So once again, oh, here we go. <laughs> Good afternoon, Pastor. Hey, woman of God. Woman of, hello. God. woman of God. Hello, hello, hello. How are you? I'm fine, Pastor. Thank you. Good to be here. Good to be Absolutely. Here. And good to also to have you here as well. Fantastic. Yes. Excited. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So on behalf of me, Pastor Fred Abeka and Lady Patience Abeka and all you amazing saints, we say welcome to today's edition of our teaching devotional, um, Epignosis Daily and Epignosis Online. As we always say it. And who's who's here? Look at what we have here. Our birthday girl. Are you <laughs> chill? Chill, please. Just take chill. We'll give you a vociferous happy birthday at the end of it all. So just Thanks, relax. Pastor. There. No, wonder, no wonder the sun is shining so bright today. Yes, yeah, so the sun always comes out my birthday. Honestly. <laughs> <laughs> it's like you, you think you've just missed summer and then mid-September. You know what? It, it pops this, up. <laughs> just this morning, I was saying that, ah, why do you have all this and all this one? And all of a sudden, I now understand. <laughs> God was preserving it specifically for me. <laughs> <laughs> That's so interesting. I'm an amazing. <laughs> Glory to God. All right. Amen. Amen. Thank Thanks for you. coming. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So shall we get into the throes of this and get into the study of our word for today? A bit to cover today. And once again, a bit technical. So I will need to really try and um, as it were slow down so that we get it so i'm going to be dead slow today the song that's been playing in the background where i don't have any copyright claim to it it is purely for the basis of our teaching here so let's get into this because there's quite some some will be a bit repetitive but it is going to do us good paul said in philippians chapter 3 verse 1 to repeat the same things to you is not grievous but he says that what it is for your own good because it could be an oversight or it needs reinforcement or it needs clarity. Okay, so let's go into this now. So how to know if a message being preached is according to the truth of the word of God. Lesson 53, we said the word truth simply means reality or accomplished fact in Bible language. So in Bible language, truth or accomplished fact was used by Jesus in the Gospels and the apostles to always refer to what Jesus did or was about to do at that standpoint as our subject. Welcome, Galaxy Note 10 Light. <laughs> or maybe Santa Mary, if I'm right. <laughs> all right, so all that. So let's quickly do a summary again. Let's do a summary. So our summary of what Paul calls another gospel. Once again, I do emphasize quite vehemently that the another gospel refers to the explanation. That means there is a set way, a, 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 a way that the gospel ought to be explained. There is, there is a complete set way. There's a fixed way, would be a better way. It's fixed. The explanation of the gospel is fixed. So when somebody fails to go by that fixed explanation, then Paul calls it another gospel. Galatians 1, 6 to 10. Again, I am shocked over how quickly you have strayed away from the anointed one who called you to himself by his loving mercy. I'm frankly astounded that you now embrace a distorted gospel because they moved away from the fixed explanation. Verse 7, that is a fake gospel. It is fake because the ex fixed explanation is absent or something has been added to it. That is simply not true. There's only one gospel, fixed explanation. The gospel of the Messiah, fixed explanation. Yet you have allowed those who mingle law with grace to confuse you with lies. So they add the law to grace. Grace has a fixed explanation. Now for information, the word grace was never used by Jesus. Jesus never used the word grace. Grace was the language of John. And grace 
was the language of the apostles after resurrection. It involves, it is the sum total of all that Jesus did. The idea behind it is in his foreknowledge, he was gracious, gracious to see, even though Adam was going to miss it and men were going to miss it, but he decided in his gracious nature to go ahead and become the substitute for us. That is why we call it grace gospel. So the grace is what the French call um, verbal locution or locution verbal, which means that we are using grace to identify the emphasis of the gospel. See, so the word grace in Hebrew language is chanan. And because they could not really understand it, they used several submissions to try and explain that nature of God. So grace is God himself. Grace is the consistent character of God. Grace is not a concept. Grace is not a dispensation. Grace is not a theory. Grace is the consistent character of God in his plan. So in the Old Testament, it was transferred as Chanan. Another Hebrew word they used for grace was Hesed or Hesed, H-E-S-E-D, which means the pure raw passion of God's love that is chasing after man to smother man with his love and mercy, just to spoil man, lavish man, whether he's at fault or not, it is that is what the man graces. So in, 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 the, in the English language, in the Old Testament, this word chanan or hesed or H-E-S-E-D was translated as loving kindness, mercies, gracious. See, those are the, the words they use. The words, they, they, couldn't really, they couldn't really get it. In fact, the worst of them will use statements like slow to anger, but God is never, God has no anger. But they, they, they couldn't because they didn't have revelation. Then when we come into Greek, because the Old Testament was Hebrew, the New Testament was Greek, the Greek used the word charis, C-H-A-R-I-S, charis. It means that a bestowal, a bestowal that a person gives you freely with a smile. See that bestow up. So Old Testament is all is all Chanan or Canaan. Okay. Old Testament Hebrew, Chanan or Canaan. They couldn't get they couldn't get words to explain that. They couldn't get words to explain that. Welcome, Sister Nina. Welcome also, Sister Vivian, and welcome, Sister Pauline, and all of are you amazing. We have a birthday girl on side, but we'll sing to her. So please don't go anywhere, don't go anywhere, don't go anywhere. Stay till the end so we can sing a voice of Pharaoh's happy birthday, Sister Jennifer. All right. So we said that, I think Star Better is on the platform as well. I said, welcome Star Better. Yeah, there she is, fantastic. So we said that grace is not a concept. See, we're quite here, people say, we are now in the dispensation of grace. No, it was ratified or it was activated when Christ came on the scene. But it has always been his consistent character. That is why in John chapter one, verse 18, he said, no man has seen God at any time. The one, who is in the bosom of the father, he has revealed him to us. And if you go further down in the verse 19, 20, 20, 20 said that the law came by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. And of his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace, favor upon favor, goodness upon goodness. You see that of his fullness. So grace was already in the Old Testament, but it was, it was eclipsed, it was blocked, it was made opaque because of the nature of man in Adam. That's why they couldn't see it, see that. So when we talk about the fake gospel, we are dealing with the explanation of the concept of the nature of grace. This has been God's plan, grace has been God's plan. It was shown to Adam in the tree of life as a metaphor. I put before you tree of life, tree of the knowledge of good and evil, tree of life, grace. I want to give it to you graciously, but I don't want to be you to be like a robot. So I give you the power of choice, you choose. However, I've told you that in deciding to go by yourself, in deciding to go by your own ways, in deciding not to go with my spirit, but I want to go with your spirit, there is death in there. I love you so much to so let me warn you in advance. I am not the creator of death. I am not the one creating death, but I want you to know ahead of time to distinguish between life and death. Can you see that? So in talking about 
another gospel. I want to emphasize it so strongly here that when we say something is another gospel, it has to deal with the explanation. In other words, there is no other two ways to explain the gospel. The gospel explanation is one, what God gave freely to man. Man only heard it and received it. So that's why in the verse seven, he said, that is a fake gospel, fake in its explanation. And he, he qualifies it. That is simply not true. There is only one gospel, one explanation to the gospel, the gospel of the Messiah. Don't forget, whilst Paul was writing this, the background was Genesis to Malachi. It means that that plan of that gospel has been there already, but you guys fail to see it in its typologies. Yet, you have allowed those who mingle. That is how you see whether the explanation is going, of course, law with grace. So any explanation, any preaching that tries to mingle add law with grace, it means that grace should be a standalone devoid of law in our spirit salvation with God. He's not talking about our soul salvation, ongoing works, conduct with man and man and living in society. Mm -mm -mm. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about when it comes to us and God, no conditions are required except to hear, believe, and receive. It is all done by himself. Now, because of the promise, the word promise he gave to Abraham, the word promises is the Greek word epangelia. Epangelia, a self-fulfilling promise. He's not telling Abraham, I need your help. No, he's saying that I will do it all by myself. All I need is somebody to believe it. That's how God functions. God functions by faith because man is on earth. Your faith is the endorsement that you allow me to do it on, on your behalf. Okay. So once that explanation is missing, then the next thing happens. Yet you have allowed those who mingle law with grace. What is law? Conditions. What is law? Compulsion. What is law? Requirements. What is law? Performance. So you have to separate law. What is law? Law was before Christ came. So he's dealing with relationship style. So the relationship style between man and God under the Old Testament was law. It's very simple. Why? Because the sin nature of Adam had not been taken out. So man had to perform. Okay. But grace is he did it all by himself. None of, none of us were involved all by himself. The moment that explanation is missing, you'll be confused. And we said the word confused is what means is the Greek word tarasu. T A R A W S U. It means to unsettle. So watch. The moment somebody comes and preaches and says, You are born again, all right, but it is your works that takes you to heaven. You now become unsure of your salvation. See that now? If you ask a cross section of believers, Would you make heaven? You will see that the answers they will give will be based on conditions. I don't know. I am not sure. Because I've done A, B, C. You see, because the explanation of what grace is in its fixed explanation is absent or it's not clear. It makes you unsure of your salvation. It makes you timid in your relationship with God. It makes you terrified. Now, you human being in Christ, you are terrified of God, terrified. So the Bible says in 1 John that anyone that is afraid, terrified of God, is not matured in his love. You have not understood the love of God. And then it makes you lose confidence. You are hesitant. All those kind of attitudes, mindset, means the explanation of grace has been tainted. You are not sure. The teaching is not clear. That's why he said in the verse 8, anyone, no one is, ex no one is exempt. Anyone, that means Paul is included, who comes to you with a different message. Ladies and gentlemen, when we say different message, it means the way it has been explained differently from the way Jesus explained it after resurrection. Than the grace gospel, see that? Than the grace gospel that you have received will have the curse of God come upon them. So the word curse there is not curse like, you know, fetish or, or, or juju or some evil. No, that's what that, you see. There is no omnibus application to any word. No one word in the Bible means the same everywhere. So this is not curse, juju, fetish, or anything like that. The word curse means restricted. It, it, um, it, it, will not, it, will not, it will not add to your Christian work in your relationship with God. 
is going to take away. So even though the person is saying all manner of things, unless you do water baptism, you will not go to heaven. Unless, when they bring those, unless, 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 unless laws, unless you do this, God will not hear you. All that is restrictive. It has restricted you. Can you see that? He said that when people preach like that, they have restricted. See, they have restricted God. They have brought in a limitation. Curse can also mean embargo. It's like they put a restriction on you. In grace, there are no restrictions. He gave you freely. Okay. That's why he even said, for even if we are an angel, appeared before you. So even supernatural manifestations of the gift must be subject to the written syllabus. Nothing of the manifestation of the spirit should be outside the written syllabus. So any manifestation, dream, vision, appearance of angels cannot be superior to the written word because the written word can be referenced. It has got a starting point, it has got a finishing point. But so-called spiritual manifestations cannot be referenced. If I tell you right now that as I'm standing here, I can see an angel. How do you reference that? How can you quantify that? See that? So, so yes, they are there, but they should be subject to the explanation. So any appearance of angels or manifestation of the gift that does not go by the explanation referenced in the word of God is another gospel. The explanation is of course. Okay, so we, we have settled that. He repeated the same thing in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. For you seem really to enjoy it if a man comes and preaches another Jesus. Not that there's a different Jesus. Another way Jesus has been explained to us that we want, down the one we preach. So I've been preaching it to you already. But now you are turning to people who are telling you, you know, they are giving additions to what Christ has done. Or if you receive a different spirit, not that you have received a different spirit, but the different way that you, you knew how the spirit should be received. How did you receive the spirit? By faith. Now that you have received the spirit by faith, why are you now adding things? He gave it to you free now. You only heard and you believe. Why are you now going by other things? Hey, let me tell you, oh, let me tell you. Hmm. You see, you cannot just go to heaven like that. No, no, you don't understand. So he said it, a different spirit from the spirit you once received. Have you forgotten how you received him? Or a different gospel from the one you received? Have you forgotten about the gospel and welcomed him? You tolerate it all. And so people tell me, they say, oh, it doesn't matter. <laughs> Pastor Red, it doesn't matter. They are all preaching Jesus. So what Paul is saying is that it's not enough to say Christ died Christ was buried, Christ was, was risen, and Christ ascended and is seated. I want to hear now how you explain it in my relationship with him. The moment you add conditions in my relationship with him, you have missed the explanation. You've forgotten that I receive the spirit only by faith, no conditions. So salvation is the reception of the spirit of God devoid of any conditions or works. That is purely what it is. So let us go into something that I want to deal with today. Now, so another gospel is all about how the facts of the gospel of grace are wrongly explained or communicated. And once again, remember Paul said, anyone, so listen, when it comes to these things, stay with the word, stay with the apostles, stay with it. Leave this place of, I know this man, I know this woman, I know this, no, 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 no. Nobody's superior to the syllabus of the word, nobody, nobody. Is superior to that. So if the facts are wrongly communicated, it would affect your mind in everything. Have you noticed that once a person doesn't accept this, it will affect your entire belief system. It will be affect the way you, you, have, you have dreams. Yeah. It will affect the way even you do you prophesy. It will, it will affect everything because superstition has entered. So Jesus, after resurrection, laid down how the gospel is to be explained. It is called in Greek, the kerugma of the mercy. When you say that, the gospel of grace, the gospel of Christ, that word gospel, the, that word preaching of the gospel, the word preaching is kerugma of the gospel. It means specific explanation. It is, it is specific, not generalized explanation. So that knocks out that idea that, Pastor Fred, you know, some people can preach grace, and some people God has called them to preach faith. Oh, as for me, my own, my own is this. No, never. The apostles never said that. They didn't say that. Ephesians 4:11. He said he gave some apostles. Now, when you see that word some, it tricks you to think that what the apostles must preach will be different. Some different. 
So no, but if, interestingly, I did a research and I found out that the sum S O M E is in italics does not exist in the original Greek submission. So sum is not even there. It reads like this, and he gave these as apostles, as prophets, as teachers, as pastors, pastoring teachers, as evangelists. Okay, watch it. For why all this, all this for the perfecting of the saints. The word perfecting means maturation, maturation. But he has not finished. Don't rush. He shows us which area of maturation he's talking about. To the knowledge of the Son of God. The word knowledge is a Greek word, epignosis, to the accurate knowledge. That accurate knowledge refers to the explanation of grace to the accurate knowledge. So whether I'm an apostle, whether I'm a prophet, whether I'm a teacher, in New Testament ministry, my first responsibility is to mature the saints in teaching about what Christ has done first, not the other way around. Under the Old Testament, Jesus had not come. So there was no message per se to explain what Christ has done. Their own was only prophecy about Christ coming. That is why their role is different. But in the New Testament, the tables have turned. It is teaching which is explanation first. Then in your explanation, the gifts of those office will aid it to go. So this explanation is not generalized. As for you, you are called to preach about marriage. As for you, you are called to preach about love. As for, no, 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 no. It's none of that. The apostles never did that. They all sang from the same hymn sheet, which is the syllabus. According to Paul in the book of Galatians, though believers accept the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, some still add in their explanation conditions to be accepted when preaching the message of Christ. In their explanation of the daily work in Christ, they include conditions to be met if the believer is yet to be accepted in their relationship with the Father. Grace was fulfilled by God alone. We only believe and receive, and the same standard of explanation remains unchanged throughout. No, so what is that all these messages of the New Testament is trying to emphasize is Christ dwelling inside minded Christianity. Now, this is where it gets serious. So follow me on this. Don't switch off at all. The emphasis of all the teachings of Jesus after resurrection and all the teachings of the apostle is that Christ dwelling inside minded Christianity. Inside minded Christianity. That is why he said in Luke chapter 24, verse 47, he said, You go and preach that forgiveness of sins. Forgiveness of sins. The word forgiveness of sins is not. Aphesis is aphesis, which means removal. There was something that stood in the way, sin nature. That's why God could not meet with man, intertwine with man. But now that I've died and resurrected, that sin nature has been put away. So the way is open for me now to be united with man in a body. That is why when Jesus died, the temple of the curtain got torn into two when he said, it is finished. The temple, the Holy of Holies, was ripped open, and people could, for the first time could see the Holy of Holies, showing that God vacated out of that place. He does not dwell in human temples, in man made temples anymore, sorry, but in human temples. So the emphasis is inside minded Christianity. It's what the Spirit wants to draw your attention to in understanding the gospel. So when you get that, and, and believers forget. Why? Because we forget. God, even when I was a believer for so many years, I still had this concept that I know that I am saved, but I felt that God was still outside. So in my worship, I mean, I'm imagining God sitting on the throne. Why don't I think of him inside? <laughs> see, see. And because of that, we make statements like, I am praying that I'll draw near to God. Draw me close to you, see inside my Christianity. They are still thinking Old Testament mindset because the concept of it is still not clear to them. Then they quote James, 
draw near to me and I'll draw near to you. James was talking to an unbeliever. The draw near means receive salvation. Receive Christ. How do we know that? Ephesians chapter 5, he said, once you were far off talking to the Gentiles, but now by the blood of Jesus, you have been brought close. Close is just a language to mean you have accepted this intertwined. So God is not far from any born again. He lives right in you. How can the one that living inside you, how closer can that be that you have to sing, draw me close to you? I'm praying, I'm, it's my prayer that I will draw close to Christ. That means you have not understood inside-minded Christianity. is what the spirit wants to draw attention to. So all the letters of Paul is emphasizing that. So let's look at 1 Timothy 1. 3. So it is this explanation that Paul warned Timothy and other apostles about. Stick to it. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3. As I urged you when, when I was on my way to Macedonia, Paul is writing to Timothy, stay on where you were at Ephesus in order that you may warn and admonish, look at that word, and charge certain individuals not to teach any different doctrine. What the, what's the word doctrine? Doctrine does not mean rules and regulation. People say, I don't do doctrine. They don't understand the word. Doctrine is not English language. The Greek word is didaskalia, D-I-D-A-S-K-A-L-I-A. -A -A. It means explanation, but this explanation is not generalized explanation. It always refers to the explanation that Jesus gave after resurrection about how the gospel ought to be explained. He said, don't let any man teach any other do doctrine. And that's what Paul also said in Galatians. They allow law with grace, different, heteros, different explanation, different doctrine. Doctrine is explanation. Do not allow anyone to teach a different explanation. And I told you the other time that in the apostles' time, they will not put anybody in leadership until the person can explain salvation correctly. Not like today. Not like today. I mean, Paul them didn't go by age. No, they want to see whether you understand salvation. If you cannot explain salvation, there is no way they'll put you into any leadership position because you're going to mess up people's minds with all this, your mix mix. He said, look at that. He said that stay in Ephesus in order. So that's the reason I'm putting you in Ephesus. That means you, Timothy, you know the correct explanation. You don't do mix mix. You don't do mix mix. You're not offended. There are some people, when you bring the correction, they are offended. And warn and admonish and charge certain individuals not to teach any different explanation. So he calls staying with this explanation wholesome explanation because it covers all and all. Look at T Titus 2 1. Paul wrote a similar letter to a, a guy called Titus. But as for you, as for you, teach, the way teach means explain. What is fitting and becoming to sound, wholesome doctrine? What is doctrine? Explanation. Sound. The word is the word, word for sound is hugaino. Sound. In other words, it does not. It does not. From every angle you look at that explanation, it has not gone overboard, flouted the way Jesus gave it to us. No mix mix. No you no know, personal personal sentiments injected. No traditional systems injected, no personal private interpretations injected. It has got its own style. You are not permitted to say, I think this is the way it is. Because John Kwame Kojo is doing it this way. So me too, I'm doing no, 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 no. It's you have to stay with it. The Bible has its own style, the Bible has its own language. And until you submit to that, Paul calls that people proud. That means you know better than the Holy Spirit, Abby. You know better than Paul and Timothy, them that God chose. You know better. Then you are coming to argue. He said, teach this. He calls what Jesus told them in, in, in Luke 24 and Acts chapter 1. In Acts chapter 1, it took Jesus 40 days to explain this to them. The same. Anything outside Genesis to Revelation is not the word of God. Because we can reference that. He said, look at that. What is the doctrine? They laid down explanation given by Jesus 
after resurrection, that refers to how he freely gives us his spirit or nature. He goes on, urge the older men to be temperate, venerable. He goes on with also by the point he made there was sound doctrine. Look at First Timothy 1.10. For impure and immoral persons, those who abuse themselves with men, kidnappers, liars, perjurers, he's talking about the law, and whatever else is opposed to wholesome teaching and sound doctrine, sound explanation, holistic explanation in terms of how you lead them. Now, there's something here which people say. They said, you see, even though you are teaching grace, you have to balance it. So you have to balance it. It is already balanced. So you cannot be teaching grace, grace, grace. You have to balance it now. You have to balance it with hellfire. No, apostles never preach hellfire. Please, if you think that I am lying, I want you to spend time in your free time. Go through Acts chapter one to Acts chapter 20 and see if in any of the messages of Philip, of Peter, of Paul, of James, of Barnabas, of Silas, of Junius, whether hellfire was ever in any of their messages. It doesn't mean hell does not exist. It is not that that saves a man. What saves the man are the facts of what Christ did. Because if you bring hellfire, it can bring hypocrisy. The man may accept it out of fear. God doesn't want you to relate to him out of fear, but out of understanding, humility, and love. He said, what? Sound. What is the sound? What has been laid down? Anything else is not sound doctrine. Titus 1.9. Look at the conditions he gave to those who are leaders in the church. Leaders, bishops, deacons, look at that. He must hold fast to the sure and trustworthy word of God as he was taught it, so that he may be able both to give stimulating instruction and encouragement. Where? Where? In sound, wholesome doctrine, sound explanation. Ladies and gentlemen, the sound explanation refers to how the gospel of grace is to be explained, given by Jesus after resurrection and followed fastidiously by the apostles, no change. And to refute and convict those who contradict and oppose it, showing the wayward, the wayward their error. They are not better than the apostles. They believed on Jesus, they stayed with the explanation. Paul never once said, you can lose your salvation. Paul never once said, the spirit will, will leave you. Paul never once said, none of them. They said the same things. You received it freely. You only believed and received it as the only condition, believing. Why do we want to add things? Look at verse 2 Timothy 4, 3 to 8. For the time is coming when people will not tolerate, endure, sound and wholesome instruction like what I'm doing. They'll say, hey, Pastor Fred, what are you saying? We have been hearing it around us so many times. Who are you? Yes, a time will come, they will not endure. They will not accept. They will not even sit down. When you start preaching, it goes to a place where it hits the point, where they, everybody has got their favorite preachers. They are offended. They will not tolerate. They are offended. They are angry. Oh, it's not me you are angry. You are, it, oh, I'm reading it. It's the Holy Spirit who wrote it. Who, what makes you think that you know better than the Holy Spirit? Hey, I will not. I, yeah, but it, he said, a time come. But having itching ears for something pleasing and gratifying. What is pleasing and gratifying? They want to tell you that, yes, Satan is powerful. Bring sun. He's, oh, it's pleasing. Wow, it's true. It makes sense. Oh, God is angry with you. Human beings, eh, we like control. We like control. We don't want freedom. That's why we want to hear things that will please us. So when you start to preach what the apostles laid down and Jesus laid down, no. You want something, you know, for, for, for us, once it's not complex and it is not humushious, Sister Nina, maybe you don't know humushious. Humushious in my country means something scary. Once it's not scary, I saw some bear and I saw three eagles. Hey, deep, you are deep, deep, mm, 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 deep. Then it's not, it's not, it's not the spirit of God. For it to be the spirit of God, it must be confusing, it must be scary, it must induce fear, it must be some strange way, it must bring warning. Yes, now you are preaching God. But when you say that, look, this thing is simple. Paul said, I am afraid, just like Satan deceived Eve in your minds, from the simplicity that is in the gospel. The gospel is simple. But men who refuse to follow the pattern, make it complicated. Said, but they have itching ears. 
for something pleasing and gratifying. They will gather to themselves one teacher after another to a considerable number. They will even gather people to refute what we are saying. I've been hearing some people that say that you cannot lose your salvation. Let's do a conference. Let's do a conference. They have got the money. Let's go to television. Let's say, hey, be careful. Watch these grace preachers. I'm telling you, you cannot take the grace for granted. You will be going to hell if you wear trousers. Yes. Yeah, yes, then everybody's applauding because they are in the main. Because once something comes on television, on YouTube, we think that they are correct. He said, one teacher after that to consider them now, chosen to satisfy their own liking and to foster the errors they hold. In verse 4, and will turn aside from hearing the truth. What is the word truth? Reality, accomplished fact, and wander off into myths. You know what myths are? They will say things that you cannot reference. I had a vision and I went to heaven and I saw them building houses there. <laughs> you cannot reference it. Once we hear the statement, the spirit of God says it disarms you because how can you prove it? That's why the word of God can be proved. It's there, it's written. Give me Bible and verse that shows me that there are cement buildings in heaven. Show me now. See, you are going into now metaphorical language. All those streets of gold, they are metaphors. It's not physical gold he's talking about. I won't go into that. He said, myths, man-made fictions away from the explanation. So the emphasis of the grace gospel is how God indwells the believer freely. John chapter 16, and I will send the comforter and he shall abide with you forever. So the spirit doesn't come and leave. No, 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 no. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Yeah, so I used to hear this when I was growing up in Christ in the churches in Ghana. They say, uh -huh, you see, when you are born again and then you want to sin, the spirit will leave you. Then you will let you sin. When you finish, the spirit will come back. If the spirit leaves you, then you are dead. Because don't you know that when you are born again, you and God's spirit is intertwined. He that is joined unto the Lord, 1 Corinthians 6, 17. He that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. It's not two. Your spirit and God's spirit is intertwined, makes no separating point. So if he's going to leave you, he's going to pull you and his spirit out. That means you are dead. So when you sin, you die. Then when you, eh? then when you do what? <laughs> when you start behaving good, then the spirit will come, then you are alive. Oh, can you imagine how many times you would have been dead physically? Eh? So the emphasis of the grace gospel, the explanation is how God endures the believer freely. It is called the in Christ realities. The spirit wants you to be conscious that I gave my spirit to you freely. Look at Galatians 3, 1 to 3. That's what Paul was saying. What has happened to you, foolish Galatians? The word foolish is not insult. The Greek word for foolish is bradus, slow to understand. Who has put you under an evil spell? Did God not open your eyes to see the meaning of Jesus' crucifixion? What is the meaning of Jesus' crucifixion? He took your place. You were not involved. You were not there. But he took it upon himself. And then he says, believe. Now, all of a sudden, now that after you have believed, now he call it, you, are, you are qualifying it by what you should do to be accepted. He has already accepted you. The proof is a spirit in you. Was he not revealed to you as crucified one? Then Paul asks a pertinent question. So answer me, you Galatians. Answer me, born again people of 21st century. Did the Holy Spirit come to you as a reward for keeping Jewish laws? And there were 613 of them, 613. All through the Old Testament, they never received the Holy Spirit inside them, despite the boku boku laws. Now, no. You receive them as a gift. Do you work for a gift? Does a gift have any conditions? Like today, it's the Jennifer's birthday. If someone is going to give you a gift, are they going to say, um, you know what? I want to see whether you are tall. I want to be sure that, you know, um, in three, day, three weeks' time, you never get angry. No, you give it to her. You receive them as a gift because you believe in the only condition. We are talking about what? Spirit salvation. Spirit relationship. I'm not talking about works 
because I live with human beings and society, my relationship with God primarily, you believe that is all in the Messiah. Your new life began when the Holy Spirit gave you a new birth. Why then would you so foolishly, brothers, turn from living in the spirit? Living in the spirit means to be born again. Living in the spirit doesn't mean I'm walking in some way. No, 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 no. By trying to finish by your own works. Now that the spirit has been given to you, he didn't require conditions. He didn't say this. He gave all of the spirit. So all of the Holy Spirit since the day you received Jesus has been living inside you. Yet you are angry every day. Yet you curse every day. You insult every day. You lie every day sometimes. All that, but he's still there. As I read, you know, but when you sin, the Holy Spirit leaves you. Where? You will see very soon. He's not going anywhere. You see, salvation is like flying on a plane. I have used this example so many times. When you left your house to the airport, you were in control. When you checked in at the airport, you were in control. When you boarded the plane, you were in control. You still had the chance to get out of the plane. But the moment the air hostess closes the door, frakatakakaya, huh? locks it, and the pilot gives the announcement and the taxi, you can't get out again until you get to your destination. That is how born again is. You people say, eh, I came in with my own will, so I can go out with my now lie. This one is not like Adam's own. You cannot. This is the only one you cannot. This one is different from Adam's own. Adam's own, there was no security. This one, the security lock is Christ. So even you fail and you miss it two million times, it is not going anywhere, whether I like it or not. And not believing that will not change it. You can say, I don't believe it. It will not change it. Jesus has done it already. It's too late. It's too late. So look at, he said, why then would you so foolishly turn from living in the spirit by trying to finish by your own works? When you received him on that day, he didn't require condition. Now, all of a sudden, you are bringing conditions to your relationship with him. And if I don't do this, God will not hear him. If I don't do this, if I don't do this, he might be angry with me. That's why he said, look at that. Why, 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 why are you going that way now? It means the explanations, it just, you have been listening to somebody or you are beginning to inject your own ideas or you are beginning to think that what is written is not enough. So you need something extra. Ephesians 1, 13 to 14. Look at it carefully. So the emphasis of the grace gospel is be inside God minded. Be inside God minded. Be inside God minded that the spirit has come to stay forever. Be conscious of that. It will guide your interpretation and your relationship with him. Nothing will do. And I'm not afraid to say that. I, am, I can defend the thesis. Nothing will do will make you lose your salvation. Not nothing. Ephesians 1, 13 to 14. In him. Did you see that in him? You see the emphasis? In him. In Christ. In him. In him is the emphasis. Because you received it freely. He wants your mind to be there. You also, who you also who have heard the word of truth when they preach the gospel to you, the glad tidings of the gospel of your salvation. The word glad tidings is the preaching. The word preaching is the kerugma. It's specific. The facts are specific. And I believed that is all you did. The word believe means adhere to, relied on him. Look at what happened. The moment you believe, the moment you you were stamped with the seal. Of the long promised Holy Spirit. This is the promise that he told Abraham. The only thing the Old Testament folks could not get is the mixing, the intertwining, the joining of God's spirit with man's born again spirit. This is what they could not get. Any other thing, God moved with them in the permissive of his graciousness. But this is what we got after resurrection. All of his spirit, not half. He said, you were stumped. Let's examine, let's examine expeditiously, exegetically, that word stamped with the sea. Verse 14, he's going to explain it. So they stamped with the seal of the long promised Holy Spirit. The explanation is in the post text, the verse that is coming after. That spirit, Kabadudadaya, is the guarantee. Huh? Did you see it? The fact that you are born again and the spirit of God is in you, is the guarantee of our inheritance. He has given you, he has given you everything. He has, you have inherited everything of him. Now he has given you everything of him. So don't start confusing that with Old Testament relationship. Eh, but you see that Esau, Esau lost his birthright. You are not Esau. 
That was a message talking about when a person rejects the gospel, this offer, that is when, when he dies, it's too late. That's what it is referring to. Kabadaya. The spirit is the guarantee of our inheritance. Look at what you call inheritance. The first fruit is not money. First fruit is not money. Old Testament people were spiritually dead people. They used physical things to communicate this. Just as a farmer brings a portion of his harvest to the market for sampling, so also by receiving Jesus, it's a sampling of the greater. What is the greater? Our bodies that will be changed. The spirit is the guarantee of our inheritance. You see the word guarantee? The seal, the first fruits, the pledge, and foretaste, the down payment on our heritage in anticipation of its full redemption. What is the full redemption? Our body. He has paid for it all, spirit, soul, body, but the spirit takes part of it first because that is where sin nature was. In anticipation of its full redemption and our acquiring complete possession of it to the praise of his glory. So the word now, follow me carefully now. So the Greek word for that word, seal, stamp. Yeah, this word here, the seal. Yeah, the seal, that word seal. Huh? That word seal, let's go to another word. This word here, guarantee. It's a key operative nouns, guarantee. Huh? Okay, let's go on. What else is there? Pledge is the same thing, the guarantee or the first fruits. Yeah. They all mean the same. There. First fruits. There. Let me add the word stamped. These are very key words, key concepts. So, what is Paul trying to let you know? That that spirit that you have received in him, how did you get it? Always don't forget that question. How did you get it? Did you have to follow some laws? Like the Old Testament people, you only did what? Heard and believed. And because he trusts Jesus' faithfulness, it is Jesus he looked at, not you. It is Jesus he looked at and said, you know what? Jesus, because I made that promise, I will give them all of my spirit. Once they get my spirit, let them know that I am proving to them that it's in an irrevocable relationship as a proof, if they cannot believe in anything, let them remember that my spirit in them is a proof that I'll give them everything. So when a man says, I don't want to receive Jesus, you have seriously insulted the word of grace. It means that the spirit of God has no value. You undervalue the spirit of God. You don't give it any cognizance. You don't give it any place. Just like some people who are born again, they are born again. They don't give the spirit any, any credence. They still think, Things of the world are more important. That's why they don't come, they don't come to prayer meeting. They don't come to teaching. They don't come because they don't see any value in it. They still see other things as valuable. He said, you are stamped with the seal. So let's look at those keywords. Stamped, seal, guarantee, first fruits. Stamped, seal, guarantee, first fruits. He wants to show you overdosingly, irrevocably, unequivocally without reservation that the spirit in you can never vacate your body and that you have all that it takes look at the strong words look at it look at the greek word the greek word for seal stamped first food is sphragizo no english language god and it it, it covers seven key areas the believers the believers see we don't appreciate salvation so when somebody comes and says, it is your works that you take it to heaven, you don't understand sphragizo. You don't understand. You are using English language to try and, and do rhetoric. You are doing rhetoric. And then you go by experience. Hey, hey, Pastor Fred, you see, I know of a believer, even though he was very faithful in church, you know, but despite all that, he died. I don't know if the person knows this. It's not by, it's not by because you have, no, 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 no. Knowledge. 
That is why in all the letters of Paul, the key operative word that he said in all his prayers, Ephesians 1 from verse 15 downwards, knowledge. Ephesians 3 from verse 12 downwards, knowledge. Colossians 1 from verse 9 down downwards, knowledge. Philippians 1 from verse 5 downwards, knowledge. Philemon 1 verse 6, knowledge. Knowledge, 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 knowledge. And this knowledge is not academic. It is epignosis, specific, accurate, comprehensive. What is he talking about? What this thing that Jesus did by his spirit. If your mind is not accurate on it, you will begin to walk through so many submissions. And you know what that can lead you to? Superstition. Like I said yesterday, look at the way we mention, we mention devil. Believers who, they give credit, everything, Satan, Satan, witches and wizards, Satan. But Paul never said that. Paul never said that. That statement in Ephesians 6, we wrestle not flesh and blood. Please take note of the English, wrestle. It's wrestle fighting. No, look, at when, when they say so many people are fighting in the pub, are they wrestling? No, wrestling is a type of fighting. What is the aim of wrestling? It's wrestle a fight. In wrestling, they don't use fists. In wrestling, they don't use kicks. In wrestling, they don't use headbutt. In wrestling, the only purpose of wrestling is to destabilize. So Paul used the word wrestle as a figure of speech to say, to stabilize your understanding of what you have received, to trick you from that. And in, he was not saying that these people are powerful. He said, you are superior to them. And 80%, 90% of the apostles writing, they emphasize our superiority because we have the spirit over these spirits. But can you see how in many meetings, believers highlight everything about the devil. When a, when a cockroach passes, witchcraft. Lizard, devil. Wind, devil. Don't you know that by doing that, you are magnifying that concept in your mind to the detriment of what you have received in Christ. Look at that. Sfragizo. God has sealed believers with sevenfold seal. Hey, if this doesn't convince you, I don't know what else. First of all, this word seal, stamp, firsthood is a seal of security. It means you are sealed tightly. You are impervious, impenetrable. It is like being in a cocoon of your own. Nothing can enter. It's like a baby in the womb of the mother, being in that amniotic cavity, locked. People think that pregnant women are weak. Hey, 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 hey. Pregnant women are the strongest. That baby inside is secure and safe. That's what it means. You are sealed. Your spirit is sealed tightly and kept secure in God's love. And the references is Deuteronomy, Job, and Matthew. These were all promises of it. It has been fulfilled in Christ. What is the meaning of the word seal? A seal of authentication that marks us as God's very own. 1 Kings 21, 8, Esther 8, 10, John 6, 27. The first Kings and Esther were promised of this. It has been fulfilled. And John is still a promise. It has been fulfilled after resurrection. Genuine as his own. Three, a seal to satisfy genuineness. You have not received a fake something. Esther 8, 8, prophecy about it. John 3, 33, prophecy about it. Fulfilled in Christ, now in your spirit. Four, seal of ownership. You think, in the case of Adam, remember, Adam was not owned by God. He gave him the free will choose. So Adam went his own way. But this one, when you believe, you are God's bona fide property. <laughs> Anything that touches you, touches God. What he is, you are. What is not, you are not. Ownership. Since the day you receive Jesus. Christ spread inside minded is the emphasis of the grace gospel. Five, seal of approval. Bam. You are always approved. Approval means accepted, always accepted. It has nothing to do whether you pray 10 hours. It has nothing to do when you went to the mountains to fast. The pleaser, Jesus, look at Jesus. Jesus, before he did any miracle, before he started any ministry, in the river Jordan, 
about 500 feet below sea level as he was baptized by John and he came out. The heavens opened and the voice spoke. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. The pleaser of God lives inside you. The one that pleases God always lives inside you. Once he's in you, you, are, you please God. You are the delight of God. Kabadaya. You are the delight. Stop thinking this always negative. I mean, I don't know why believers, it's, it's superstition. Satan, can, Satan is a fallen angel. He himself was created. There is no demon, except you don't know this. I don't know why we are so gang ho on demon, demon, Satan, Satan, demon. I'm not saying they don't exist, but they are no match for the believer in Christ. Don't you understand? It is your saying it that is making him know that I didn't know they are giving me such authority. We interpret everything to be demon. I don't know why we be African believers are like that. Everything is demon. But the apostles never did that. I, I read something this morning. In Paul. Paul wanted to go to the church in, in Corinthians. And for some reason, things were not happening. You know, and then Paul said it felt that the troubles he was facing, he said it felt as if we had the sentence of death on us because we turn here riots, we turn here riots, we turn here persecution, we turn here. Hey, Paul didn't conclude and say, Hey, this one is for my village. Oh, this one is my village people. I'm sure Paul just said, Paul just said, but on all these things, I know God. He, he put his emphasis on God. When they are they cut off James' head and they arrested Peter, look at their prayer. Look at their prayer in Acts chapter 12, verse 5. He said, prayers were made to God in their prayer. Ladies and gentlemen, they never said fire roast them. Fire roast the, 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 the soldiers, roast the government officials, roast those who were working in the praetorium. Let them die by fire. None of that. None. They rather pray to God. The Bible said that they made fervent prayers to God. And that caused an angel to release. You won't see any of these prayers that we are talking about. May their houses roast with fire. Because Jesus died for them. He wants also that we wish all men to be saved. Oh, and I know what you're thinking about. The, the Elijah prayer. Elijah was not born again. So Jesus corrected that even in Mark chapter 9. When the disciples asked him, should we call fire from heaven to devour these people like Elijah did? What did Jesus say? The Bible said, and Jesus rebuked them. That word rebuke is the same word used to cast out devils. He said, you do not know what manner of spirit you are. For the son of man did not come to destroy lives, but to save them. The Bible says in Hebrews 38, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. That means Jesus is consistent. What he told those two gentlemen, if he was there when Elijah did it, you would have, you have rebuked Elijah the same. That means Elijah used the power wrongly. The power is not for destruction. I don't know when we hear the word power, fire. We think it's destruction. The word fire is not to destroy. The, word, the fire of the Holy Ghost just means the enthusiasm, the passion. The Holy Spirit creates passion for soul winning. It's not destructive fire. See, you see, see, Africa, our, our idol worship mentality, juju mentality. God does not destroy. He said, I wish above all things that they may be saved. Who wishes all men to be saved? Seal of approval. You have been approved. Seal of righteousness. You are made right. Always. God sees you as right. Always. Because of his spirit in you. And seven. Seal denoting a promise to be fulfilled. So now he has given you spirit to know that you are mine. I am with you forever. And I, it will culminate in me giving you the same body I have now the glorified body so the mark given by the beast upon the forehead watch it mark the forehead is a metaphor this one people don't understand forehead eh? in 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 greek <laughs> in greek mythology and eh? forehead in greek culture is a metaphor for knowledge the book of revelation is all about symbols and, and metaphors it's a metaphor for knowledge, for thoughts, and mindset. Referring to the tree of knowledge of good and evil, which is what? The Adamic nature. So when they say the mark, the word mark is theon, nature, 
The word mark is not mark like I make a mark on your skin. The Greek word is theon, mark, mark, theon. It always refers to stamp, seal, or nature. So when we say the mark of the beast, the nature of the beast, and the word beast here on its forehead, beast there refers to the nature, the ghastly nature received from Adam. It's metaphor language now. Don't go literal. But you see that in Adam, it was the mark of the beast, Adamic nature. That's the most serious sin, of course. But in Christ, the seal of Christ, a new nature is over our hearts. So Jesus, our bridegroom, is placed in him over our hearts like a fiery seal of love, the jealous flame of God that burns continually in our hearts, which is typified in songs of so many ages. We are born of the spirit, glory to God, sealed with the spirit, indwelled by the spirit, baptized in the spirit, filled with the spirit, made one in the spirit, given the gifts of the spirit, and given ministries by the same spirit. This is the true gospel where the spirit wants to emphasize the inside-mindedness of Christianity, not the outward. So when the emphasis goes on the outward, in relation to our relationship with God, then Paul calls it, your explanation is going outside this, and it's called another gospel. In Jesus' name, amen.